this is what I want out of your life, and I'm going to expand you, and I'm going to bring you back to the homeland. We saw that in Genesis 28. Jacob was basically saying, this is where my worth is. This is what my value is. And these are, this is the goal for my life. Jacob knew that God's hand was on him. Therefore, he wanted to get on with his life. It is important that you affirm your value. Know your value to the company. Know your value to the business. Know the worth and value of your business. The seventh thing is that you need to have a plan. Everybody needs to have a plan. Whether you have, obviously, if you own your own business, you have to have a plan. Everybody knows that. But what if you're an employee? You still should have a plan. Genesis 30, verses 31 through 32. What shall I give you? He asked. This is Laban saying, what, what, what do you want? And Jacob answered, he says, don't give me anything. I thought that was an interesting statement. Don't give me anything. But if you will do this one thing for me, I will go on tending your flocks and watching over them. Let me go through all your flocks today and remove from them every speckled or spotted sheep, every dark colored lamb, and every spotted or speckled goat, and they will be my wages. Now, let me give you a real quick history note. In the Middle East, sheep are normally white, and goats are normally brown or black or brown, black, black, brown. What Jacob was saying was, look, I will take the odd lot. I'll take the exceptions. I'll take those that are different. I'll be the different one. And I'll focus on the exceptional. You get where I'm going with this? I won't try to be like anyone else, is what Jacob was saying. I'm not going to try to be like everybody else. In fact, I'll try to not be like everyone else. That was his plan. His plan was to be so radically different without being a burden to Laban. Because see, Laban didn't want those lambs. That was that they were considered to be uh, they were considered to be bad news. They were they were not considered to be all that healthy. They were considered to be misfits. And so it was the 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 the, uh, the ranchers or the farmers, whatever you want to call them. They wanted white sheep, and they wanted brown and black goats. That's what they wanted. And when they had sheep and goats that were speckled or spotted or something, striped or whatever, it was like, oh, no. Oh, man, what a waste. And so Jacob says, no, I'll take those. I'll take those. And that became his plan, a plan that depends on the blessings and works of God. That's so important. When you build a plan for your life, I would suggest that you build a plan to be exceptional. To be exceptional. And that not only will you be exceptional, but it is completely dependent on the blessings and the provisions and the works of God. That's not a timid lifestyle. In fact, it's a very bold lifestyle. And this was such an act of faith on Jacob's part. He was saying, look, I'll take the exception to the rule and I'll build my life. That will be my wage. I'll take that which you don't want. And I'll build a life out of it. Now, I, I want to say something that, that will, will help you understand this even, even to a greater extent. And that is, uh, well, really a couple of things. First of all, you need a plan that defines what your success is going to be. It's not just a plan like, okay, from, you know, my goal is, you know, in, in, in 30 days I'm going to accomplish this. And then, you know, I, I go to these seminars and they say, well, you've got to have a plan. Thirty days, you got to be here, and a year, you got to be here, and five years, you got to have five-year plan, and so forth and so on. Those are all well and good; they're okay. But what Jacob is talking about here is a plan that defines success. He's not saying this is where I want to be. He's saying this is what is going to be success for me, and it is a plan that is completely dependent on God. Jacob wasn't being vague or ambiguous about his plan. He wasn't saying, okay, well, if you're within the parameters, I would like to take some, you know, 12 sheep, and then over the period of two years, I'd like to have 36 sheep. You know, he wasn't doing, he wasn't, he wasn't just kind of like throwing numbers out and just kind of being, you know, because numbers can lie. He had a plan for success that clearly defined the results. The results were, I am going to take these sheep, the ones that you don't want, and I'm going to build a life out of that. And if I fail, then that will, be, that will be the reason. But if I succeed, that will be the reason. A plan, you need to have a plan that actually defines what your success is going to be. 
How do you define the success? The second part of it is that you have to have a plan that starts where you are. A plan that starts with what you have. It's interesting to know that they were able to pick out all of these odd sheep and goats in one day because they were so few. Now remember, Jacob had been working for him for 14, at this point probably 15 years, and there were a lot of sheep and a lot of goats. But in one day, they were able to pick out the misfits, the ones that Laban didn't want. That's how good Jacob had been. That's how, that's how successful Jacob had been for Laban. There weren't a whole bunch of misfits. There weren't a whole bunch of these spotted lambs and, and miscolored goats. He was able to pick them all out in one day. Start with what you have. Jacob knew exactly what he had to start with. And he didn't borrow any goats. He didn't borrow any sheep. He just started with what he had. Have a plan that's realistic that starts with what you have, not with what you don't have. You don't need to, you don't need to, you don't need to be setting goals for yourself. Okay, when I get to this point, then I'll start. No, start with where you are. Start with what you have. That is where your plan begins. The eighth thing that we see about Jacob, and it was a principle for his success, is in verse 33. And that is, have integrity. Have integrity. Verse 33, and my honesty, the word for integrity, will testify for me in the future. Whenever you check on the wages you have paid me, any goat in my possession that is not speckled or spotted, or any lamb that is not dark colored will be considered stolen. He said, you know me. You know my integrity. And I can just tell you right now, in the future, you can come and check my herd anytime. And you check the herd, and if you see any speckled sheep, or if you see any spotted goats, or anything like that, you'll are uh, white sheep, or, or pure black, or pure brown goats, if you see that, you'll know that they've been stolen. They're not mine. They're yours. He was speaking from a standpoint of integrity. He was saying, look, this is what I will, this is how I'm going to run my business with integrity. And you can check on it, and you can follow up, and I expect you to check on it and follow up. I'll tell you, this integrity thing is a character that is sadly, sadly lacking in our society today. It's been lacking for some time. And it seems that the greater the responsibility, the less integrity is shown. Just look at Washington, D.C. Integrity is something that we drastically miss and need in this world today. And businesses, if you are working for a company, if you have integrity, you are worth something to that company. Unless your boss is a crook and doesn't want somebody with integrity on her. I wonder what would happen to so many of our business leaders and our politicians if they prayed David's prayer that's found in Psalm 7 8. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness, according to my integrity, O Most High. I was thinking when I was preparing this lesson, you know, I'd kind of like to take that verse and send it to every congressman. Except I don't think they get it. But we need this. Our world needs this right now. And God's people are the one that can provide the integrity in business. You need to be a person of integrity as an employee and as a business owner. David understood the value of integrity. He knew how important it was to God. Look at Psalm 41 verse 12. In my integrity you uphold me and set me in your presence forever. Now let me point something out. David had failed. Remember David had cheated he had caused, he had murdered a guy to get his wife. He had committed adultery. He was a cheat. He was a bum. But God had forgiven him and straightened his life out. Now, it's real easy for us to go, oh, well, you know, isn't that great that God straightened his life out? And because we're separated from it. But if you had been part of his life, would you have been able to forgive him? God got a hold of him and forgave him. And he became a man of integrity. A man of great integrity. I'm here to tell you that even though you've had a life that has caused some problems and a life of sin and a life that has really, really destroyed not only you, but maybe even some other people, God can forgive you and you can live a life of integrity from this point on. 
God says, I'm looking for integrity. I'm looking for a remarkable change in people's lives that's different from the world. Integrity. The Bible has a lot to say about this critically important character trait. And I want to read just a few verses. Proverbs 10, 9. The man of integrity walks securely, but he who takes crooked paths will be found out. Proverbs 11, 3. The integrity of the upright guides them, but the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. Titus 2, verses 7 and 8. In everything... Set them an example by doing what is good in your teaching. Show integrity. Seriousness and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned. So that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Integrity. The Hebrew word for it means to be full of simple uprightness. To be full of simple uprightness. In other words, to do what is right because it's right. Bye.